you think about it, 30 years ago, when we lost one of the most important allies in the region, the Shah of Iran, to the Islamic Revolution, we didn't have one troop on Middle East soil. We had no naval power inside the Gulf. And we, as the United States, were beloved in the region. We represented the hope of democracy and the practice of freedom. Today, we have to look back and realize that we have instigated three major wars in the region. We have a huge naval presence inside the Persian Gulf. We have an enormous base inside uh, Bahrain. We have a massive air force base in Qatar. And we have invested guns and butter in vast amounts and yet seem unable to resolve our problems in, the U in that region or to further protect US security. Most important, we are no longer loved. We are even by our friends looked at with some concern and by our enemies, of which we have many, we are thought of as a bully, as the supporter of dictators still, and as having practiced torture in the region, and as conducting, as I speak, drug wars. I would say that a lot of the roots of what we are seeing today as the beginning of a new Cold War, in fact, were planted many years prior to the end of the last Cold War. In fact, for those who remember Iran, I'd like you to take your memories back 30 years and remember Iran, because there were two major developments in 1980 that are critical to where we are today. The first was the hostage crisis. It began the 30-year standoff that has occurred between Iran and the United States, and which over time the United States has little by little been able to convince its allies to join. The second thing, was the extraordinary success and rhetoric of the Islamic Revolution. This inspired not just Shia, but also the Sunnis to think that there was another way to approach modernity, that Islam had a major role in addressing modern politics. Recently, it has been suggested that instead of increasing arms to the Syrian opposition. Washington should possibly work to convince Russia and Iran and Saudi Arabia and Qatar to stop all arms flowing into Syria. If we are not to be defined as a state that had a unipolar moment but proved diplomatically weak, and we're not able to use that diplomatic moment and that power to create real change beyond warmongering, that's an idea worth thinking about. Because not only would it reduce the killing on the Levantine plane, but it really could head off at the pass a second global Cold War. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Orange County Cross Talk Show. I'm Alex Borucci. I'm here at the World Affairs Council in Orange County and tonight the keynote speaker was Dr. Roxana Farman Farman Young. That was a wonderful speech I have ever seen I have to <laughs> about the Middle East. It was very objective and up to the point. I would like to ask you um, 
I know with the, all the things happening in the Middle East and you know Obama administration seems to me you know handicapped about the whole thing if you were going to give him advice about the Middle East in particular with the relationship with Iran what would you that well I as I mentioned in the Please look at as the I thank you as I mentioned in this speech I think that he really could exercise some diplomatic clout to uh, stop any kind of uh, put an embargo on arms going into Syria which would definitely bring down the intensity of the fighting there but he would have to do it on all counts. It would have to be an embargo. And I would recommend that they start negotiating a uh, way to go forward to become uh, communicative with Iran. It does not necessarily have to be across all issues, but to work on these common issues. Syria is a common issue. So is the border with Afghanistan, I have to say, where an enormous number of uh, drug smuggling is a key interest of both the United States and Iran. These are much less political issues. They are places uh, where it, uh, they are side negotiations where both countries can build trust and confidence measures. And I think that is critical at the moment if we're going to see any of the real solutions uh, that the, the Middle East so desperately needs and that ensures that it doesn't start consistently broadening out we see that it has, is, is taking its toll in Europe. It's going to keep going into other parts of the world. So this is a role that the United States needs to play, and I think that it is possible to play that as long as it doesn't try to take on too much. Do it quietly, but start communicating with the Iranian leadership. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, one of the things that always seems to me from the U.S., not only the, the politician, but the media you see, is always a, uh, the, the question of threat, that they want to threat Iran with sanction, with this war. and that. So from your perspective, uh, what, what, what do you see the major problem here? Why can U.S. and Iran cannot get along, so to speak? Well, again, as I mentioned in this speech, I think it really does go back to the period of, uh, from the United States' perspective, the hostage crisis. It, the United States has never been so shamed and humiliated by a country as it was by Iran during that critical moment. And for Iran, it in fact goes back to the time of the CIA overthrow of an elected political leader, uh, Mohammad Mossadegh, and his replacement by an authoritarian uh, monarchy, namely the, uh, the Pahlavi regime, through American intervention. So these are two events that have had fundamental political impacts on the way these countries view each other and uh, has, I think, informed all the other international relationships that they've had. And it has simply gotten worse over time, which is why I date it back to then, because if it was anything else, Iran and the United States would have gotten over it. They share so many common concerns. Iran is a major oil producer. The United States is in business in this world to be in communication with energy producers. And so it does not add up that they were not able to find common ground. The reason is because of the grudges that they hold against each other. And that's why it cannot have a breakthrough in the full face of the media. It has to be in the back corridors where negotiations can be made without having to live up to statements and without having to have everything splashed across the media and the public sphere. It's got to be done quietly, but it's got to be done. Uh, I'm sure you have heard that recently that Iran and U.S. are talking one to one, so to speak. And do you see any merit, uh, merit in that uh, you know, talk or discussion they have? I see a great deal of merit. What I don't see yet, and perhaps it's because they are conducting this in private and we don't know what is being said, but so far I am not seeing that there is real understanding on either part. They are not using language that either of them really understand. And I think it really does take individuals that are 
thoroughly uh, knowledgeable about the events and the leadership in both countries that uh, are needed to bring them uh, to a common table. Uh, thank you very much, and I would like to welcome you to, to Orange thank County. You very much and for let's watch you. more of her talk. Today's investment by the U.S. military beginning to wind down, we nonetheless maintain that network. We remain heavily present in the Persian Gulf, having recently transferred an enormous amount of military arsenals into the Gulf Cooperation Council, which includes Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and Saudi Arabia. In fact, it has been the largest transfer of military hardware in history. And today there's talk of linking the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, with NATO. Clearly a Cold War move. The U.S. has come out of that period in the Middle East quite tarnished. And those that have thought over what occurred in Iraq, many are drawing similar conclusions. We were also not easily able to come out of the Arab Spring uh, in a way that would have built up our reputation there. We had to ignore the democracy activists in Bahrain because we have our largest naval base on that small island. And Bahrain was a Shia uprising. And there is no question that with the heredity that goes with the relationship between the United States and Iran, dating from the time of the hostage crisis, as I mentioned, the US remains very ambivalent about the Shia. Quite lukewarm about Maliki in Iraq, and still very much more aligned with the Gulf uh, Sunnis in uh, the Emirates and Saudi Arabia, as well as with Jordan and Morocco. And so, in a circuitous route, I am coming to the core of this argument, and that is Syria. This is the killing grounds between the Western-supported Sunni, armed and funded by the Gulf, and the Iranian-supported Shia, as aligned with Syria's government, which is turning out to be the most brutal yet in the region. Critically, Syria is the intersection of the two great crescents that now divide and arc across the Middle East. The Shia Crescent, which you all know about, which King Abdullah of Jordan uh, called the Shia Crescent for the first time in 2004, and was an idea picked up by Tony Blair, who rephrased it as the arc of Shia extremism. This, of course, is led by Iran, and now, today, is territorially linked through Iraq onto Syria and to Lebanon in the form of Lebanon's uh, largest and strongest political party, Hezbollah. Because the U.S. and the West are generally very ambivalent about the main members of the Shia Crescent, Russia and China have provided their great power support to that Crescent almost by default. The second Crescent is the Sunni Crescent led by Saudi Arabia, and ever since the arrival onto the scene of Al-Qaeda, increasingly containing a virulent component of jihadism. Its leadership still very much enjoys Western support. It runs from Saudi Arabia, it goes through Western Iraq, Jordan, Egypt, on to Libya, <coughs> Tunisia, and these days, Mali. Both crescents are opaque, volatile, and run by ex or led by extremist governments. Let's first quickly take the Shia. This is Iran's game. But what kind of leader is Iran these days? 
An editorial in the Financial Times over the weekend described it as, quote, isolated diplomatically, crippled economically, and boxed in militarily. And unquestionably, from the Western perspective, that is all true. We might add that after watching the US trounce Iraq in 100 days, when Iran itself had been unable to achieve that in eight years, that Iran is also very uninterested in encountering the United States in a shooting war. Finally, we can also comment that President Ahmadinejad, who has been an absolute nightmare from the perspective of the United States, has in fact been an equal nightmare for Iran. He is brusque, divisive, and poisonous. And it is with enthusiasm that Iranians, certainly at the upper echelons, are looking forward to the elections that are about to be held in June, which will be heavily contested probably within the conservative camp but will spell the end of Ahmadinejad and no doubt bring in a much more emollient character and certainly one hopefully and probably more in tune with the leadership so that a more consistent line can emulate from Iran. What is not a part of this upcoming election is going to be the Green Movement, which has been crushed despite at times various hopes that I read about on the part of the US government in our press. The parts that perhaps are less well described by the Financial Times is that certainly sanctions have had an effect on the Iranian car economy. But what we may forget is this is not a small economy. It is a huge economy and has learned to adapt over the course of 30 years of sanctions about how to operate even under these new crippling sanctions. There's a new gas pipeline in the works going from Iran to Pakistan. There's another one supposed to be going through Iraq into Syria and on to Turkey. It is a country that is not really economically suffering. From the perspective of the nuclear program, politically we know there is simply no decision yet that has been made on developing the weapon of mass destruction. And Iran seems to be very happy to engage in negotiations that simply stay in stalemate. It has already made the majority of the major investments it needs to make in the weapons of mass destruction. It has already invested in its ballistic missile uh, program, and it's up at 25-30% of uh, nuclear enrichment. So those are the two big investment areas. Negotiations serve Iran well. It keeps Israel at bay, letting Iran focus on Pakistan and India, which are, to it, much more important nuclear powers and they, just like Israel, but not, it must be said, like Iran, they are not part of the nuclear non oh, never can say this, nuclear non-proliferation treaty. Iran is. It does have inspectors go in regularly. So it's quite concerned about what's going on on its eastern side, not so much about what's going on on the west. So we see that the Middle East is at the heart of this misalignment of great powers. And this poses its own dangers to US interests. The Gulf leaders of the Sunni Crescent, to whom we are close, though they are rich, they are also deeply conservative. They are increasingly repressive in the wake of the Arab Spring. They are growing more interventionist supporting very conservative Sunni governments throughout the region. This is something Saudi has always done, by the way. It has always built conservative madrasas, and it has always promoted Salafism and Wahhabism. And by being so tied to Saudi and so alienated from Iran, the US very simply finds that it cannot be a player in serious solution 
except to provide more arms. By condemning Iran's revolutionary guards and, Le and Lebanon's Hezbollah as terrorists, it is unable to sit down at the table with those two significant actors in this particular drama. So what is the result? Extremism is growing. Extremism is spreading the Syrian conflict. So we see the spread of this conflict. I could, at the time of questions, happily go into what's going on in Lebanon, in Jordan. And let me just for a moment take a look at Israel, which is becoming very worrisome even as we speak. The border between Syria and Israel is becoming increasingly tense with mortars from Syrian-based extremist groups falling into Israeli settlements that lie in the Golan Heights. If pushed, this is very likely going to become a new front in this war. And Israel will, fo will follow through and fight very much as a proxy in fighting Iran. And as Syrian extremists at the moment are beginning to push the idea that they can move from Syria and promote the Palestinian cause, the likelihood is that if they do this and follow that war cry, the 60% of Jordan's population, which are Palestinians, will most likely help that state tumble into. So what do we have? We have a gathering global Cold War with a very, very hot Syria at its core. This is translating into an increasing international standoff illustrated by the absolute inability of the Security Council to find any common ground. The US and West on one side, Russia and China on the other. Kofi Annan saw absolutely no solution and resigned. His successor, Lakhdar Rahibi, who also has a great deal of experience, was UN Special Representative to Afghanistan and Iraq. He's negotiating as hard between the global powers to try to find some common ground there as he is in any of his negotiations with internal Syrian opposition groups. Recently, it has been suggested that instead of increasing arms to the Syrian opposition, Washington should possibly work to convince Russia and Iran and Saudi Arabia and Qatar to stop all arms flowing into Syria. If we are not to be defined as a state that had a unipolar moment but proved diplomatically weak, and we're not able to use that diplomatic moment and that power to create real change beyond warmongering, that's an idea worth thinking about. Because not only would it reduce the killing on the Levantine plane, but it really could head off at the pass a second global cold war.